ان الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ما بعد السلام عليكم <laughs> you learn fast man I like being in India I'm having a good time over here The food is really warm I'm getting by on one meal a day by the way That's enough I'm doing it live But I guess what I like the best over here really is you like in our country it costs a lot of money to go out and entertain yourself it does it's very expensive If you want to go uh, for entertainment, let's say you want to take the whole family out, could cost two or three hundred dollars for a weekend just to go to Six Flags or Disney World or Disneyland, something like that could cost a lot. But just in the ride over here from the hotel, I saw all of the rides in one. Oh my God! How can you drive like this? I look at that window in the van as we're coming over. It's just, I, ah, ooh, and don't let the driver know you're scared. Big mistake, because then he's going to really do it to you. Whoo! Oh, now our subject. They asked me to talk about Islam and terrorism, or how to make a bomb in five easy lessons. We're, oh no, that's not it. I'm sorry. <laughs> This is the kind of attitude I get, though. People will come up to me and they say, "How come you Muslims is terrorists?" This is how it starts, and it gets worse after that. So what I decided to do is to devise a way to be able to respond to these people in a very positive manner that would help them to get the real picture of Islam, and at the same time, hopefully, they will come to Islam. Because consider myself, and if you remember the story I was telling you last night, I was anything except a supporter of Islam, and yet I became a Muslim. So if Allah can change a person totally upside down, like me, He can do it to anybody. So I decided to really work on this subject and see how to present the case. First and foremost is to remember that when these people come to you with these questions and talk to you like this, whether it's through the internet or if you're meeting them in person, you have to remember they're a human being like you are, and they have fears. And if you'll recall, Dr. Jaffer Sheikh Idris was speaking on the subject of Islamophobia. He only gave half of the speech that night because he said he wanted to leave the time for other speakers. So I wish he would have given you the whole thing. And I feel shy to try to go in on top of the sheikh's speech, but one of the things that he left out was when he usually tells us about that phobia. Phobia means a fear of something. Some people have a fear of heights to go up real high. That's called acrophobia. And some people could have a fear of uh, well, I tell you what. There's one that when uh, that's called hydrophobia, the fear of water, and that's when people have something called rabies. Hydrophobia, because of the fear of water, they can't drink water. Okay, so and I have taxophobia when I come over here. Now that here is tax ecab phobia, and when I'm back home, it's tax period. But in any case, phobia means a fear of something, and these people have a fear. They said of Islam, and they call it Islamophobia, but actually they have a fear of what they don't know. It's the fear of the ghaib. So maybe we should call it.、Uh, Ghaibophobia. Can we do that, Bella? Can I do that? Mix the Arabic、okay. Anyhow, he has so much about the Arabic language. When he gets up here, make him tell you. When you go to Q and A, make him tell you all about this、uh, work that he's done in developing Arabic for non-Arab speakers. It's very easy to learn Arabic with his courses, by the way. That was a free ad. Next one will cost you. Okay, and now back to the program already in progress. When you want to answer the question, watch this. Somebody comes to you. How come you Muslims is terrorists? Just keep your cool and say thank you for asking me about my religion. It will always totally unarm them. They will not be ready for that. 
They're expecting you to be like, uh, uh, or something, you know. But you say, smile, smile. Say, thank you for asking me about my religion. You ask me about Islam. What is Islam? It's an Arabic word. So we have to understand it in that language, not a translated language, right? So what is Islam? Islam has five words inside of it. Surrender, submit, obey, sincerity, and peace. And he's going to be going, huh? Because he wasn't ready for that. And you tell him, in our religion, it's important for us that we always have to tell the truth. We can go to hell for lying. And besides that, you could catch me if I lied anyway, because we have all of our scripture. It's still preserved. Even if I make a single mistake, Somebody was just telling me a few minutes ago about a mistake I made the other night. And you can do that real easy because our scripture still exists. We still have it. The Quran is totally as it was 1400 years ago in the Arabia. Additionally, we have all of the Hadiths and teachings of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, preserved for centuries and centuries. So there isn't any two kinds of Islam. There's only one understanding. Islam is about this. Submitting and surrendering and obeying God in sincerity and peace. And if you didn't understand that, then you won't understand the rest of what I'm going to tell you. But for sure you have to understand that it describes your relationship between your Creator. So Islam is immediately saying there must be a God. And we say Allah because it suits Him much better than your word God. Because your word God only has this little G for any kind of a God and a big G for the big God, but if I'm talking, you don't know if I meant the big G God or the little G God. So when we talk about it in Arabic, it's nice. Because for Arabic, they have a lot of words, many words for sword, many words for horse, and certainly they have words to describe the religion of Islam. The word in Arabic for God is not Allah, it's Elah. And when you make God plural, you put an S after it. But it's real clear in the Arabic when you make it plural, awliha. You can hear it. Allah, awliha, ilaha. These are big differences between them, right? They'll go, yeah. So you have to understand that when it becomes Allah, this means something. It cannot be made plural, and it's not genderized. So therefore, the God we're talking about has a name called Allah, and it means the only one, not male, not female, and can never be made plural. And because it comes from a root, Elah, which means something to be worshipped, you can literally say the name indicates the only one worthy to be worshipped. You see where I'm going with this, right, as I'm talking to him. I got off the subject of the terrorism, didn't I? But now I'm going to bring it back and tell him, do you know that people, human beings, have always been able to commit terror against each other or oppression? It's called bulum in the Arabic language. People have always had this capacity. It's not something that was just invented so that Bush could get elected. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to attack anybody, but just happened to mention that. Just so you know, human beings have always been able to kill each other. Since the time that there were two boys, sons of Adam, they were able to kill one another. One killed the other one, yes or no? That happened. And since then, people have been killing each other like crazy. And it's horrible. But who's the best one to tell us about this subject is not another human being, but God himself. Is that right? Because he made us. So he has sent people to us to warn us about the way we act here and the way we're going to be in the next life. We call them prophets or ambia, nabi, Rasul, okay, it doesn't matter, but you get the idea, they're prophets. And each of them, they come with a message. Some of them came with books. And when Moses, for instance, came, he told his people, worship God alone, don't worship anybody else. There's no gods beside God. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me, first commandment. Right? They'll go, yeah, all right. But what happened... When Moses was on Mount Sinai. And now they already knew they're not supposed to worship anybody but God. Didn't they know that? But when he was on Mount Sinai, what did they do? They made a golden calf or not? And it's in their book. It's in the Old Testament. Don't worry. It's the same story. It's there. It's in the book called Exodus. 
which means to leave, because they left Egypt. All right. Just as they disobeyed their prophet, and we were bad boys and girls. So likewise, when prophets come, this is the way people treat them. They get bad treatment. But they still have the same message. Worship your God alone without any partners. And that's really all Islam is about. It, there's rights and limitations. Right after we talk about the worship of the one God, the next biggest thing is about rights and limitations. But for sure, you have to understand, this is not from a human being to another human. This is from the Creator to the created. This is from the manufacturer. Hmm? So when he sends down a book or a revelation, you can think of it like what? Owner's manual. Ah. And just like the Jewish have their Torah, which was the owner's manual during the time of Moses, certainly you would recognize that when Jesus came, peace be upon him, that he had revelation that supersedes what came before, kind of like 3.2 or 3.4 version coming out, right? So when he came, didn't matter what they had anymore, he's the one to tell them what's to do. He's the man, right? In fact, he called himself that, son of man. Just thought I'd make that point real clear. It's in the Bible. Now, so when Muhammad wasallam came, he did not say, I have a new religion. He didn't say, guys, worship me. In fact, he was a very austere person. He did not have a lot of wealth. He wasn't trying to, you know, gather up a lot of money. So, this came with him. Now is when you introduce the Quran. It's called Quran. Now in Texas, a lot of people mispronounce it. They call it Koran. But it's Quran. But regardless of what you call it, it doesn't mean a book. It doesn't mean like the Bible. Bible comes from the word Biblios in Kone Greek, which means a book. And by the way, the word Bible, like we said last night, it's not in the Bible. But the word book, Kitab, is in here. Trinity, not in the Bible. But it's in here. And it says, don't do it. The wrong way to go. This gets them thinking. You're stimulating them as you go along. Now, sometimes you wouldn't give them the whole thing, but you take your time and let them see that you're a human being just like they are. This is very, very important. More important than what you say is what they see. Because this is how they're going to perceive Islam from you. That's, you're their contact. You're our salesman. You're our representative in the field. And you've got to be up to date. And you've got to be up to snuff. And you've got to be doing your thing. You see what I'm saying? Everybody with me? You've got to be the best Muslim you can be. So remember that. And if they disrespect you, do not disrespect them. And remember, somebody better than you and somebody better than me was highly disrespected by his own people. Yes or no? And did they throw stones on him and he bled? And when he had a ch- if somebody throw a stone on me, okay, and then you tell me that they, Allah is willing to put a whole bunch of stones on them, like a whole mountain. <laughs> <coughs> but alhamdulillah, the Rahmil al-Amin, which is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He's the mercy to the mankind. And what did he do? He prayed for them. Which is following the same idea of Jesus, peace be upon him, who taught his people the same thing, to live in peace with people, even when they're aggressive to you, that you show this peace back to them. And so we do the same thing. By now he's really thinking about it. When you're talking to this person, now you can ease into the subject of terrorism. Because they need to know what's Islam first. Does it say... Anywhere in the Bible, because this is the book that most of the Christians are working out of, is their Bible. Does it say anywhere in the Bible about going to war and destroying people? Well, they probably don't know, but the answer is absolutely yes. If you go to the book of Genesis, it's called the Rape of Dinah. Go look it up. Go look it up. When the tribes, or the sons of Jacob, got in a little bit of a problem, one of their daughters was with the Mushrikeen, so instead of just going over and asking her to come back, which they did that, but they saw there was a resistance, she didn't want to go, and the boy didn't want to give her up. So they decided to go against him. But then they saw the Mushrikeen had a bigger tribe, 
So they said, oh, we, we can't do that. The Mushrikeen, however, wanted to strike peace with them. They made agreement. They wrote up a deal, a signed deal. Hmm? Firmed up. They said, here's the deal. We want to go to your religion, and then you can have our daughters, and you, we'll take your daughters, and we'll give you our sheep and our land and everything. The Jews said, no, you can't do that because you're not really from us. They said, well, what's it going to take? They made powwow or mashura. They came back and said, okay, here's what we'll do. You have to make khatan, which is uh, circumcision on the private part, okay? And then we, you can be our brothers. This is all in their Bible, by the way. All of this is in the Bible. Any copy, go get it and read it. So they did. It said these tribes went and they did that. They, all of them, thousands of them. And they said on the third day, when they were so sore, they couldn't even get up. You know? Okay? They said, then they went in and killed all of them. It's in their Bible. They killed them and took their women. They killed everybody. They turned their children into slaves, raped their women, and destroyed all of their animals. Yes. So we see people have been doing these kind of things for a long time. Now, the reason for taking them to this chapter of the Bible really was because I want them to see that their book has something much stronger and very hateful in it. By the way, it does end the chapter. It says that Jacob did not approve of it, didn't like it. And I'm sure he didn't, if it even happened. So now when we come to the Quran, and the Quran has something in it, because sometimes they'll just come up to me and say, or like emails you get, how come your book says you have to kill all the Christians and the Jews? Hmm? And you say, that don't have anything. No, no, no. We saw it on the Internet. It said, kill all the Christians and Jews wherever you can find them. How many of you heard something about this? Anybody heard about what I'm talking about? You heard about it, right? Some Muslims think that's true. But that's misquoting it really big time. Big time. But what was it really about? What really happened? And we're going to take this because you're accusing the Quran of saying it. What it says in here is that they were forbidden, actually, to participate in any type of thing like this until a certain time came. Because it talks about in the beginning for them to learn about Allah. And they spent a lot of years studying and learning how to obey God on His terms and what He wants from us. They had to give up drinking. Alcohol became forbidden. They never knew that till the Quran came. No alcohol. Whoa. But it came in stages. First, just don't drink it while you're praying. You know, no drunks praying. Well, that makes sense. And then, all of a sudden, no more drinking. It also commanded them in here, no more sex outside of marriage. You have to be married. Otherwise, big problem for you. So, no sex outside of marriage. By the way, now on another program, maybe we'll talk about women or something like that, and I'll come into it. But when you're talking about the women, this is a big subject. When they start to say the Prophet Sallallahu is some kind of a sex offender, and they say horrible words that I'm not going to use here or anywhere when I talk about our beloved Prophet Sallallahu But, just so you'll know, I want you to think about it. I don't want to leave the subject before I mention this. The Prophet Sallallahu cannot be accused of something like that. You know why? Well, isn't it true that he got married when he was 25 years old? He never had sex with any girl ever. And by the way, for the clarification of the Americans, we have to say, or a boy, because they don't know, you know, about this. Huh? So he never had sex, period, till he was 25 years old. Zero. Right or wrong? When a boy is most interested in that subject, is not age 25. It starts somewhere around 12 to 17, and that's what the doctors tell us. That's the scientists telling us that. Okay? Every man here knows about his own hormones. I won't get into that. But you understand exactly what we're talking about. At 25, the man has calmed down a lot. He spent the next 25 more years, am I right, married to Khadija. And during that 25 years that he was married to her, he never, ever had sex with any other woman, and again, for the people in San Francisco, or men. Didn't do it. Totally, totally one woman for 50 years. Now, how are you going to tell me that after that, all of a sudden, that he went out here and did what? 
Excuse me. Come on. Come on. Let's look at it closer. We can break that one down in the, one of the other sessions. But now I'm going to come back to the terrorism thing. There is a passage in the Quran that says, and kill them. Absolutely says that. That is what it says in Arabic. It uses the word kital, yukatilu. It says it. And it means to kill. But in what sense of the word? Unfortunately, some of the translators got really excited, and this is about 70 years ago, and they used the word slaughter. That's not very good. That was not a good choice of words. Because today, people, when you say slaughter, they think you're going to do like the biha on somebody. Especially when they're talking about Muslims are cutting off heads and all the rest of it. It's scary. What kind of religion do you have? And I understand their trepidation. I had the same problem. This affected me the same way. But then I came to know that this is not Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam, as we're going to see in a minute. For those 10 or 13 years that the Muslims were enduring a lot of oppression from their own relatives and families, their own tribes, who were coming up against them and attacking them and abusing them, even physically, they were not responding back any more than just simple self-defense. They never organized any kind of a combat against them. Now, underline this word, combat. Did you hear me? Combat. I want you to use that word when you're talking, because we're going to come back to it. Okay? Now, what happened was, after the Muslims had been put out, they had sanctions against them, they were outside of their territory, they, nobody could go out to where they were, I forget what you, exiled, like exiled out of their own uh, property, put out, left to die out in the valley for a couple of years, long time. They made a migration to Medina. And when they were there, then they became reinforced, and then a verse comes. Okay? But it tells them to go make Hajj. Go read it. It's in Surah Baqarah 189. Telling about Hajj, that the months are known to you. The moon, the months, this is what you go by lunar calendar. This is time for your Hajj. That's what it says. Unless somebody changed it. They didn't change it in 1,400 years. I'll just check it right now. I can remember the Bibles that I used to pick up when I was preaching. I would pick one up and I'd go, oh, set it down, pick up another one. This is the wrong one. <laughs> There's a beautiful thing about Arabic and the Quran. It doesn't change. Yeah, here's what it says. They ask you, Muhammad, about the new moons. Say, these are signs to mark the first periods of time for mankind and for the pilgrimage, the Hajj. It's not Albir that you enter the houses by, by the back, but, Allah, but Albir is that you fear Allah. It's a taqwa for Allah. So enter your houses through the proper doors. Fear Allah that you'll be successful. Wa. Katilu. The word is wa. What is wa? That's and. Nobody begins a sentence with and. You ever have me walk up to you and say, and the bus shall be here in about... No. They don't say and. They say the bus will be here. Huh? Or they'll say when will the bus be... But and when will the bus be here? Nobody talks like that. So likewise, Allah didn't talk like this. He doesn't say just wa. Unless it's like wa al-asr. In that case, it's a swearing by something. But it says wa katilu. So do kital for the sake of Allah. I'm going to leave it in Arabic for you for a minute, and I want you to think about it. Those who do kital to you, but don't transgress the limits. What did I tell you earlier? Islam is about rights and limits. Rights, yes, but limits. And here it comes. Don't transgress the limits. And do kat Katilu, do kital to them wherever you find them and turn them out from wherever they turned you out. And al fitna is worse than kital. And don't do kital with them at the Masjid al Haram, the place of making the pilgrimage, unless they first attack you there. But if they kital you, then kital them. Such is the payback for the disbelievers. But if they cease, then Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. And kital them until there's no more fitna. And worship is for Allah alone. But if they stop, then let there be no transgression against the volimun, the polytheists or wrongdoers. I, again, I repeat, I left it in Arabic for a reason. Because if you start trying to play with this and use different words, 
to have variety in English, you're going to get in trouble. And you'll say things like kill, slaughter, maim, destroy, stuff. And we, and this is not really the essence of what's being said, inshallah. Because if you understood it, as I understood it, the Muslims have been turned out of their own property, of their own homes, their own na land and nation, yes or no? You, everybody with me? Everybody's still awake? Am I boring you? Okay. So, here's what we're saying. When Islam came to these Arabs, it didn't come to teach them how to fight and kill people. They already knew how to do that. Think. Remember before Islam came, they had a 40-year feud, a war between tribes over a camel race. Is yes or no? A camel won the race. One of the other tribes threw a rock, killed the camel. They killed the boy. They killed that boy. They killed this one back and forth. Forty years go by and they're killing, killing, killing over what? A camel race. You don't have to teach Arabs how to fight. They're born with a rock in their hand. They know how to do it. What Allah did was to take time to let them learn how not to fight so that you can find the balance between rights and limitations. So he gave them the limit first. Huh? And they were very patient. Very patient. They had to be patient. The Prophet wasn't going to let them be any other way. They had to hold back, hold back, hold back. And then the order came. Okay. Now, Yukatilu. What is Kital? I'm going to translate it as mortal combat. Mortal combat. Because you have to translate to a word that's in use today that people know how to use it and how it works. Mortal combat. Meaning I've got to be willing to kill and be killed for the sake of what? To stop al-fitna. What is fitna? Now we could go back and read the verses again and you'd see how the combat fits right in there. Do combat with them because they did combat with you. Stop the combat if they stop the combat with you. You see how that works all the way to the end. But then at the end, it, it says, and continue the kital uh, until the way can be established for Allah. And some of them said this means until they submit and become Muslims. Even, even Muslim translators said it. And it's wrong because that would negate another beautiful verse in the same surah. La ikraha fi deen. And Allah doesn't compel anybody to submit to Him. That's what you got to lie for. It's always going to be your choice. But what it does, it establishes it so that there is a way for people to come to a law. The door is open. You don't have to, but at least there has to be some kind of a setting where people can know about what's Islam and know about a law and then be able to come to Him. It has to be their choice. That's all it's talking about. So we've solved all but one thing. What's fitna? Fitna is when things are so bad that... that Islam can't spread. It's so bad when you can't do anything. It's like really the worst. It's like what you say in Texas. It's kind of like falling down in a rolled up barbed wire fence. It's fitna. So when you see aggression and oppression, and when you see the big guys coming down on the, bad, on the little guys and doing bad things to them, innocent women, children, elders being attacked, being killed, people being thrown out of their homes, being run over by bulldozers or whatever, then this is what? Fitna. Now, in English, the best word to call that is what Mr. Bush calls it, terrorism. So fight them until the terrorism is over. With what? Limitations of combat within God's limitations. Make sense? So who declared the war on terrorism? Mr. Bush? No, he only repeated. And he, at the same time, by the way, when he said this on Thursday night, two days after 9-11, stood on the White House lawn, made the announcement, told everybody that he's declaring a war against terrorism, he said in the same speech, Islam is a peaceful for religion. Well, that's a very nice thing, and we support him in that. And we support a war against terrorism because we got the eyes for it right here. In fact, if he'd like to make shahada, we'd like to accept it. There'll be two guys from Texas. How about that? All right. Now, 1,400 years ago, Allah told us the rules and regulations, the rights and limits for combat. And that's what it was talking about. But it's important for Muslims not to sidestep the issue. Don't say Islam is peace 
And all we want is peace and there's no fighting in Islam unless it's self-defense because that's not true. Just as Mr. Bush ordered the people to go into Afghanistan because he wanted to preempt anything that was, could happen there. He went into Iraq and preempt anything that could go into there. And he gave a good example so when people want to know what happened at the wells of better, ask Mr. Bush. Well, he's an expert on this subject. Preemptive. So, combat. Terrorism. So, Islam is the answer for terrorism. You get out of line, there's a rule. Because you have rights, but I have rights too. And so does every other person of the seven billion human beings on this earth. Every single one of them has rights. And, it, and Allah is the creator of all of them. And He wants all of them to have their rights. So it's up to us as people who understand that to stand up for what is right.